Come on, let's give Jesus an incredible round of applause, everybody. Come on, you may be seated. Man, we can just camp around communion all day, can't we? I'm telling you, it's about him, you guys. It is about him and everything that he's done for us. Amen. Well, hey, if you are just joining us, we are actually in a series titled Soar. And over the past couple of weeks, we've kind of pulled back the covers of what's going on in our society, of, uh, you know, what's going on in America, and we're shining a light on all the darkness, right? And uh, today, I'm going to continue that series, but I want us to take a 10,000-foot leap, right? I want to I give us a 10,000-foot view, a bird's-eye view as to what is going on in our culture. But not just that, uh, I want to I pose the question, what is our response, right? As Christians, what is our response with what we have revealed and the darkness that is going on in our land. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, I'm going to read verses 13 through 19. And I'm reading from the ESV version. When it says this, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who in his heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, guess what? Will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This morning, if you're taking notes, the title of this message is Eternally Driven. Eternally Driven. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here. God, I don't need to do nothing but just submit to you right now. It's yours. This is your floor, God. This is your church. And so we just say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Continue to do what you're doing. God, we submit to you. We yield to you right now. Come on, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Well, 20 years ago, I woke up and I found myself handcuffed to a hospital bed. I was incoherent. And I was still drunk from the night before. There were two police officers standing by my side, and they were actually reading me my rights. Because of my actions of the night before, an innocent man lay dead. He would lose his life, and I would end up actually going to prison. You see, at the time of the accident, I was a severe backslidden Christian. I was running from God, and I was running from everything the Lord had for me in my destiny. You see, by all measures and statistics of society, someone who grew up like I did should actually be one of three things. I should be dead, or I should be homeless, or I should actually be prison, in prison, but by the grace of God. Let me tell you about the grace of God. But by the grace of God, I stand here before you a changed man. But God. You see... Something happened to me when I was in prison. I knew that my life would never be the same. And that if I was going to be anybody in this world, if I was going to make an impact, it was going to come as I lay down my life for Jesus, as I go all in for him. You see, I had this drive in me to be better. I had this drive to be somebody in this world, uh, to leave a legacy and an impact right here in my generation. And I had a choice. I could have let the circumstances of what I was going through dictate the outcome. I could have continued on that pathway of destruction. I could have thrown in the towel. I could have given up on my life completely, but I didn't. Why? Because I had a heavenly perspective. I saw the bigger picture of what was going on in my life. I saw what God wanted to do in me and through me. And so let me ask you this question this morning, City Point Church. What drives you? What motivates you to get out of bed? What drives you to be all you can be, right? 
What drives you to make the decisions and the choices you make every single day of your life? What motivates you? You see, over the past two weeks, we've taken a look at the current state of our country, right? The, the laws that are trying to be passed. Uh, uh, we've seen the godlessness that is reigning all across the land. And we have looked at what could be potentially on the horizon of wars and rumors of wars in our land. Uh, we've taken stock that the spirit of the Antichrist is here. The spirit of the Antichrist is here, and he is deceiving, and he is bringing deception. And Jews and Christians all around the world are starting to be, uh, are, are starting to be attacked like never before and hated on. And we have sensed the fear in the air, the fear of the unknown, right? The, the state of our economy possibly collapsing. Uh, will my children ever be able to use the restroom without another gender walking in on them, right, in, in a dressing room, right? These are things that we are thinking. Uh, will our country turn to socialism? And will my wealth be distributed uh, between everybody? And the government, will, will they take what I have, right, uh, you know, on my land? Are we on the, world, the verge of a one-world government? Should I store up food or should I just lay low and mind my own business? And so my question for you today is what is your response as the remnant church in these last days in the face of so much uncertainty and in the face of so much fear? And can I just say that God wants to give you a heavenly perspective, that he wants to give you a 10,000 foot bird's eye view, a heaven to earth view as what is going on in our current culture. Did you know that eagles can fly up to 10,000 feet high? And they have extremely powerful vision. You, you see, they have the ability to spot a rabbit two miles away. Uh, they're one of the strongest eyeballs in the, in the, in the, in the entire world. And, and they're eight to, four to eight times stronger than that of a human. And are, their eyeballs are specially designed for long distance focus with extreme clarity. They can see long distances with extreme clarity. And so in the same way that the eagles have long distance clear vision, the heavenly father wants to give his church clear vision in this hour and in this season to see the bigger picture. That he wants us focused on the right things, church, instead of being focused on the wrong things. He wants us to set our mind on what things above, right? He wants us to take a 10,000 foot view of everything going on and give us the proper perspective. Look at Colossians chapter three. I added verse one in there so you guys don't have verse one this morning, but it says this. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, what does it say? Seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Look at verse two. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, we're living in what theologians say, we're living in between the fallen order and we're living in between the redeemed order. And it's our jobs as Christians in this era of time to call people out of the fallen order and to call them into the redeemed order, all right? That we are not to get caught up in the affairs of this world, but we're to get caught up in the affairs of the redeemed world. You see, most Christians, we're just sitting around waiting to be rescued off this planet. We're just hiding out in fear. Oh, come, Jesus, come quickly, Lord. Come and save us. You see, being eternally driven, it doesn't mean waiting to die so we can go to heaven. That's not what it means. Church, this isn't a rescue mission. He's not coming to rescue us out of this forsaken world. God, just come quickly. No. What if I was to tell you that Jesus had other plans? That he came to bring and establish his kingdom here on earth. Not to rescue it from this planet. And see, having a heavenly perspective means that it's the church's job to pull the supernatural realm into the natural realm. Why so more of earth can look like heaven? Did you know that's your job as the church? We have this heavenly perspective so more of earth can look like heaven. Can I just say that the world is waiting for the church 
to invade heaven, to release the glory of heaven here on earth. And it says in Romans 8, 19, for the creation eagerly waits, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And so do you wanna know what being eternally driven is? It's bringing more of heaven to earth. That's what it is. And it's your job to do that. It's your job to bring more of heaven to earth. And see, revival, it's not going to come through a political figure. Hello? Hello? It's not going to come through a political figure. It's not going to come by us hiding in fear, waiting for God to come and save me from this planet. It's not going to come through that. It's going to come through the church who begins to get a backbone in our life. And it's going to come as we, as we come to the, as the church and we begin to stand up and we begin to speak up and we begin to show up with this heaven to earth perspective, right? This 10,000 foot view of what God is doing and what he wants to do in our culture. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6.10? He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on what? On earth as it is in heaven. You see, it's our responsibility to bring heaven to earth, to establish more of his kingdom so more of heaven can be here on earth and so more of earth can go to heaven. That's our job. It's our responsibility. And so how do we do this thing? How do we live with this eternal drive and this eternal perspective? And there's two things, City Point, that we need to realize this morning. And then there's a third point that I want to talk about, an activation point. And the first point is this. We need to realize who's in charge. Hello? Church? Who's in charge? Who's on the throne? Come on, the Antichrist isn't in charge. The Democrats are not in charge. The Republicans are not in charge. Come on, who is in charge, you guys? We need to realize that. Look at verse 15 in our text. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, who? The son of the living God. You see, in a kingdom, what does a king do? A king rules and a king reigns. Right? He sets the rules and he sets the laws. Right? He casts a vision for the kingdom. He uses people in the kingdom to outwork his plans and his purposes, which are to advance the kingdom and to gain territory and to ensure the well-being and the prosperity of the people in the kingdom. Did you know that the British Empire at its peak was the largest empire in history? And it covered a quarter of the world's populations. And one of the main purposes of the British Empire was expansion and influence. So what would they do? They would gain territory, and they would begin to influence that culture with what they believed, with what their political culture said, with the languages and the laws and the customs of the land. And so in the same way, when Jesus came, he came to establish the kingdom of God. Right, where he rules and where he reigns as king. And his vision for this kingdom is to advance and take territory in the land and influence through political, cultural, and language and laws and customs. Who said that Christians should not be involved politically? Who said that? In fact, this is why we're in the state that we're in. Because Christians have sat down. Oh, we don't talk about God. We don't talk. There's three things you don't talk about, right? You don't talk about God, religion, uh, you know, uh, or you, or you don't talk about religion, politics, and taxes. Come on, who said that, you guys? It's not political, it's spiritual. And when Christians begin to get political through spiritual practices, maybe this nation will begin to turn for good and for God. And so it says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Listen to this. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Look at this. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is a forever kingdom. There will never be an end to the kingdom of God. So why are we waiting to get raptured up out of this place when it's our job to bring heaven to earth and it's our job to establish his kingdom? Come on, it's kingdom. 
And see, I believe that in the midst of everything going on in this country, uh, Jesus is asking some of you this morning that same question. Who do you say that I am, church? Who do you say that I am? Because I can tell by some of your Facebook posts that you don't believe Jesus is on the throne. I can tell by some of the things that you're posting online that you don't believe Jesus is in control. And he's asking you that question right now. Who do you say that I am? Oh, come on. I can get feisty too, Pastor Aaron. He, he likes spicy. I like spicy more. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But who do you say that I am when times get tough? When the elections don't go your way? Who do you say that I am when the doctor gives you a diagnosis? Who do you say that I am when the storms of life come in like a flood? When you lose your job? When the economy sucks? When the life is just hopeless? City Point Church, who do you say that he is in your life? You see, a lot of us in this room, we want to confess him as Lord, yes. I confess you as Lord, God, yes. But when it comes down to it, is he actually master of your life? Is he Lord of your life? Do you give him full reign in every single area of your life? Because he is a king and we are members of the kingdom. Let me just encourage you. We are in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We're in a kingdom that has no end. And there is no demon in hell. And there is no devil on earth. And there is no pol a pub political figure. And there is no government and no kingdom that can overcome and conquer this kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. And to this kingdom there is no end. And he is the one who rules. And he is the one who reigns. This is the kingdom of God. And so why do we live like we don't belong to members of this kingdom? I'm coming in and I'm coming out. I'm in the kingdom on Sunday. But man, Monday's coming around. I'm, I'm just going to go hang out. Come on, church. Hebrews 12, 28 says this, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer up to God acceptable worship with reverence, with reverence and awe for what our God is a consuming fire. Come on, this king of this kingdom is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. He can consume by the breath of his mouth. He can destroy by one word from his lips. He is a consuming fire. T.Z. Koo said this about the kingdom. The kingdom of God does not exist because of your effort or mine. It exists because God reigns. Our part is to enter this kingdom and bring our life under his sovereign will. Listen, church, in this election season, keep your eyes on the king, not on the man or woman running for office. Yes, we need to lead the way and we need to vote biblically. Yes, we need to do that. We need to vote for the platform that best represents the kingdom the most. But do not put all your hope in that one basket. We serve the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. What are we going to do? We're going to realize. We are going to realize. We're going to realize. I lost my point. Where is it at? We're going to realize something. It's, there it is. We're going to realize who's in charge. Come on, you guys. You cannot rehearse this, I'm telling you, it's there. We're just normal people, you guys, okay? We can speak really well, but we're just normal people. So we're gonna realize who's in charge. Point number two is this, we're gonna realize that you have the authority to bring heaven to earth. Come on, as the church, you have the authority to bring heaven to earth. Look at verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, what does he say? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so what Jesus is telling Peter is he's saying, upon this rock I will build my church. And he's not talking about the apostle Peter, as the Catholic church seems to think that they're talking about. The Greek word for, for rock there is the Greek word petra. It's the Greek word for foundation or bedrock. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, Peter, upon this bedrock belief, what's the belief? The belief that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So he's saying, upon this bedrock belief that I am the Christ, I will build my church, which the Greek word there is ekklesia. It's the first time that church is mentioned in the New Testament. I will build my ekklesia, and, I, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But not only that, I'm going to give you the key. Peter, 
I'm going to give you the keys. What do keys represent? The keys represent authority. You know, I have a key in my pocket. This key right here can open up every single door in this building. Every door in this building, I can go in or I can go out. I can stop you from coming in a door and I can stop you from going out. Why? Because I have the authority. But that authority didn't come on my own. That authority was given to me by a higher authority. Right? It was given to me by a higher authority. You see, a door is meant to be a barrier. But once you possess the key to that door, guess what? It no longer hinders you from coming in or coming out. You see, we possess the keys of the kingdom. You know what that means? That means you have the authority of the kingdom. You have the authority of the kingdom. And see, as believers, uh, not only do we have authority, but we have a total authority over the powers of Satan. That there is nothing the enemy can throw at you to deter you or to slow you down or to cause you to give up because you possess the keys to the kingdom. We can take authority over evil spirits and we can take authority over the evil spirits that are ruling this nation right now. You can. You're the church. You have the keys to the kingdom. And I think it's time that the church begins to realize how important we are to this nation's affairs. We're important. And like I said earlier, we're in this mess because we've taken a back seat. Did you know that the separation of church and state, it wasn't meant to keep the, the church from meddling in the state's affairs? It's quite the opposite. It's meant to keep the state from meddling in the church's affairs, but the church was always meant to, to, uh, to impact the results of the state. And so if we can just get some godly men and women to start to rise up, to start to say, I'm gonna lead the way, I'm gonna get into the political arena, and I'm gonna start to run with godly morals and godly principles in this land, I'm telling you, this nation will be flipped upside down. It will be flipped upside down. You see, the life or death of this nation, it has always been in the hands of the church. Always. If you go back to our founding documents of a nation, you will see that we are a Christian nation whose God is the Lord. Right? You will see that. And what they want to do is they want to bury that deep down because they don't want you to know that. Right? That we are the ones who carry the mighty name of Jesus. And we have the powerful strength of the gospel to bring life and abundance to every person, to every sector of our society. We are the ones whose prayers can change a nation. We're the ones whose prayers have the authority to change a seat in the office. You, wanna, you, you think Colorado can switch back to red? It can through your prayers. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't let them change some wording to get you to vote for them. Don't do it. We're the ones who carry the kingdom of heaven, and we have the backings of heaven's armies behind us. You see, the church can lead the way at the ballot box, you guys, in a couple Tuesdays. And did you know that if all the Christians in, the, in, in, in America would vote, we would win every single election? That's truth. We would win every single election. And I, for one, will not vote for the platform who's built this platform upon everything God hates. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to vote for that platform. I mean, abortion buses at the Democratic Convention? Are you kidding me? In the parking lot? And you think this is a political issue? They also had sex change buses at the Democratic Convention in the parking lot. Their platform is built upon everything God hates. So how can you, being a Christian, come in here on a Sunday and lift your hands to a holy God and then go in there on a Tuesday and vote for a platform that goes against everything the scriptures say? Maybe you're not used to hearing this type of preaching. But maybe you need to listen to it and hear it because somewhere along the line, your theology got mixed up because my great daddy, daddy, daddy voted that way, so I'm going to vote that way. If you just know your Bible and you begin to vote biblically. I'm not saying the other platform is, is completely uh, holy, right? No, I'm calling for Trump to repent, uh, uh, for him to allow the states to even uphold abortion. It should be completely eradicated. You see, in 2020, Joe Biden won Arizona by 10,000 votes. 
or 730 evangelicals in Arizona did not vote that year. Creepy Joe won Michigan <laughs> by 154,000 votes. 1.3 million evangelicals in Michigan did not vote that year. Uncle Joe won Georgia by 11,000 votes. 1.3 million evangelicals in Georgia did not vote that year. He won Pennsylvania by 80,000 votes. 1.4 million evangelicals in Pennsylvania did not vote that year, church. If we would just do our due diligence, we would win every single election. We have the power to sway that in our country. We really do. And so what I'm saying is it's time for the church to take up our rightful authority as members of the kingdom. We're going to realize who is in charge. And we're going to realize that you and I, we both have that authority to outwork God's plans and to outwork his purposes in this world. If I can have the keys out, that would be awesome. Point number three is this. The next thing we need to do is we need to exercise your authority. Turn to your neighbor and say, exercise. Turn to the other neighbor and say, your authority. Now say it with a little bit of gangster. Just get a little gangster. Exercise. <laughs> Exercise the demon, right? That, that movie. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble for another bad movie reference. Okay. <laughs> Come on, look at verse 19 in our text. What does he say? I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I will give you authority. And whatever you bind on earth shall what? Be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so Jesus... He's the king of the kingdom of heaven. And what he's done is he's transferred his authority to the church, both you and me. And he's given us the keys. And now it is up to the church to begin to exercise that authority. Uh, just a few th Sundays ago, I took my son fishing. And uh, let me tell you, he's got the Scadden fishing gene. I'm telling you, that boy, that boy can catch a fish. He outfished his daddy twice now, and I'm like, dude, I can't let that happen ever again. I'm not helping you. Like, you're going to cast out your own pole from here on out, bro. I'm telling you. I cannot be beat by my son. Well, anyways, we're sitting there, and about 100 yards away, there was a campsite, and there was a man and a woman there, and he was drunk, and he was just being super belligerent. F this and S that, and he was singing really awkwardly, and it was loud, and my son could hear it, and I, and I said, Josiah... I said, do you hear that language? And he goes, yeah. And I, and I said, have you ever heard daddy speak those words? And he said, no. And I said, there's a reason, uh, because that's profanity. And that man probably doesn't know Jesus. And so don't pay attention to those words, son. And it just kept getting worse. And I finally had enough. I said, oh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rebuke that. And so I stood up and I began to rebuke the spiritual realm right there on the beach. I began to take authority over the, over the spirits that were controlling this man. Right, I rebuked the spirit, I, I binded the spirit of profanity from his life, the spirit of pride, and I began to war in the spiritual realm. And then all of a sudden I stopped and you felt the peace of God enter in to where we were at. You know, that man didn't say a single word the rest of the night. A single word. And even in my unbelief, I'm like, God, is this gonna work? What if he does it again? What am I gonna tell Josiah, right? But he didn't say anything, why? Because I took authority over the spiritual realm and a greater authority stepped on the scene that day. You see, a lot of the times as Pentecostals, we take this verse out of context and we start binding and loosening everything. I bind this and I bind that and I lose. And it's fun and it's awesome, but here's where the danger of that is. If it's not from heaven, it's not gonna be done here on earth. It's not. If it's not in agreement with the laws of the kingdom, it's not gonna be done here on earth. And Jesus understood this the most, and he says this in John chapter 5, 19. He says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing, right? Heaven to earth. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. And so we have to be careful with that, right? That we can't just go around binding and loosening everything. It has to be in agreement with the kingdom of heaven. You see, as Christians, if I'm going to live my life that is eternally driven, where I live with this heaven-to-earth mindset, then I am not to partake as one who is outside of the kingdom, but I am to operate as a member of the kingdom. 
Well, what does the outside of the kingdom look like? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, for, neither fornicators, sex outside of marriage, nor adulterers, anything that is in front of Jesus in your life, nor adulterers, sex while you are married with someone else, nor homosexuals, same-sex attraction, same-sex sex, nor sodomites, that one doesn't need it. An example. Nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, hello Christians, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelries, which is a drunken orgy, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is what it looks outside of the kingdom. And I just want to show you a few slides that I found off the internet to, to give you a look at the current culture around us. Can you show the first slide? Look at the first one there. Tim Waltz signed a bill making Minnesota a sanctuary state for child sex change. Look at the one on the right. Son becomes daughter and mother becomes father. What is this heresy? Can you feel the demonic coming off of these two pictures? That a little child, like that little boy in that picture, can be so influenced by an adult to make him think that God created him wrong. Look at the next, see the next one. We support abortion on demand without apology. And there's a movement right now of, of women who are just angry. And they're like, I want to kill without an apology. Abortion without an apology. It is my body. It is my choice. I'm going to kill that child on the inside of me. There's women that are like, I, I, I did it for fun. I, had, I got pregnant just so I can have an abortion. Look at the one on the bottom. Let me just say this, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but we as the church cannot go to sleep in this hour. We cannot go to sleep in this hour. You can take them off. We cannot allow this demonic agenda to continue to permeate our culture. We're here to advance the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. We're not to bend or break to what the popular majority says is truth. We're to stay in line and in reference with what the Bible says is true. We need to love this and honor this and cherish this and outwork this with everything that we have. You see, the kingdom of heaven is countercultural. It requires repentance. It requires forgiveness. It requires humility and reconciliation and equality and love and grace. You see, in the kingdom, the supernatural realm is the natural realm. It, it, the extraordinary is just ordinary in the kingdom of God. The least of these are the greatest, and the first shall be last, and the last first. First, the demonic is not welcome in the kingdom, so why do you keep entertaining those demons in your life? Some of you have been a Christian for 30 years and you keep coming up to get delivered from the same demon over and over and over and over again. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have the power of the Almighty God living and dwelling in you. Maybe you need a little bit of discipline in your life. You have the gift of the Spirit that is self-control. It's time to grow up, church. It's time that we grow up. It's time we put aside the childish things of this world. And it's time we stop drinking just the milk of the word. 
And it's time we start acting like adults in the kingdom. It's time we start to grow up and stop entertaining those thoughts. Stop entertaining, well, I'm just always depressed. Stop entertaining those things. There's help, there's deliverance, there, 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 there's, there's freedom in the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom is all about growth and being externally driven is about saving souls. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but maybe you need to increase your daily encounters with Jesus. We're still in the season of the year of Gethsemane. We're still in the, the season of, the, uh, of revival in your secret place. And how is that going with you? If you want to increase your daily encounters outside of this room, it's going to start as you get on your knees inside of your prayer closet and shut your door. Where your father who sees in secret will begin to reward you openly. Maybe for some of you, we need to get some discipline in our lives. We need to develop a habit of reading his word more. We need to develop a habit of coming to prayer. Men, 5.30 a.m. every Thursday morning. This last Thursday, we had 40 men praying at 5.30 right here. God is calling you to get up and get here. Tuesday night at 6.30, we have corporate prayer. Every Tuesday night, God is calling you to get here and pray and intercede for our nations. Thursday at 12 p.m. right here, uh, right next door in Auditorium 2, there's prayer going on. Maybe you need to take a risk, step out in boldness. Maybe you need to share your story of salvation. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna realize who's in charge. We're gonna realize that we have the authority to bring heaven to earth. And then we're gonna begin to operate and use that authority. In Jesus' name, I wanna close with this story. In Luke chapter seven, verse 20 through 23, John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus and he was in prison. Everything around him was hopeless. He was about to be beheaded. Everything looked bleak and dim and soon everything that he's seen leading up to that moment just washed away and he was doubting who Jesus was. He was doubting that he was the Messiah and so he asked his disciples, he said, just go, go to Jesus and just ask him if he is the coming one. I need some hope in this moment. And in verse 21, it says, In that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And, on, and then there were many who were blind. He bestowed sight. And he answered the disciples. And he said, Go tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. He said, The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Church, can I just encourage you that no matter what happens here in a couple weeks in this election season, it's still business as usual in the kingdom of God. It is still business as usual in his kingdom for his people. It is still business as usual. It is still time to go and cast out devils. It is still time to go and raise the dead. It is still time to preach the gospel to the poor. It is still time to cleanse the leper. It is still time to get the lame to walk again. It is still that time no matter what. Why? Because if they're just one more soul that needs to be saved on this planet. It's going to come through us. It's going to come through you. As the church of Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, God, forgive us, Lord, for taking a back seat. Forgive us, Lord, for getting our eyes off of you, for not being heavenly minded for focusing on what, what's going on around us, Lord, and, and for forgetting, God, that we are members of the greatest kingdom this world has ever seen. Oh, God, we repent of that and we turn towards faith in you. And right now, God, everybody listening, I empower them right now to go forth and be the church. God, anoint them one more time. Fill them with that all-consuming fire. Fill them with the fire of the Holy Ghost, even now, God. God, I loose their mouths in the name of Jesus to speak truth, to be righteous, to live a godly life, to not bow down by the standards of society. But I empower them, Lord, to live a life fully devoted and dedicated to you to be eternally driven. Lord, we love you. If you receive that, just say amen. Thank you, Lord.